Okay. Hello everyone, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen students, colleagues, distinguished guests, Jamaica Kincaid. Welcome everyone. It gives me enormous pleasure to open this very special gathering in honor of our distinguished guest and this year's much deserved Family Prize Award, Jamaica Kincaid. As I'm sure any lover of English literature or any literature knows, Jamaica Kincaid is an award-winning author of numerous essays, short stories, and novels, which offer evocative portrayals, among other things, of family relationships of her native Antigua, striking for their lyricism, incisive emotional honesty, and a complex artistic exploration of many modes, uh, sorry, a mode of autobiography which veils as much, as much as it reveals the many modes and moods and moments in life of the author as charted from her first collection of short stories at the bottom of the river, published in 1983, to her more recent novel, See Now Then, which came out in 2013. This isn't, of course, um, Kincaid's first visit to Tel Aviv, I understand it's your third visit to Tel Aviv and fifth overall in Israel. So, welcome back. And I hope your visit this time around proves just as enjoyable and interesting for you, as I'm sure you note all that has changed and much that hasn't. And we love to welcome you back here. I want to take this opportunity um, to thank the Literature Department and Professor Iris Milner, its chair, and my colleague, Professor Milet Shamir, for co-organizing and hosting this excellent event, an exciting event, and Smadar Fisher, the director of the Dan Devi Prize, for helping us to realize it. And most of all, my warmest thanks to our guest, Jamaica Kincaid, for joining us here today to talk about our work. So please join me in welcoming Kincaid, as I also invite Professor Milet Shamir, who will moderate the talk. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, you can you hear me? No, no. no. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. So this isn't on. It is. It should be on. Yeah, maybe try this. Is it all right now? Oh. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. So Jamaica, um, as Noam Reisner um, already mentioned, it is a great uh, honor and privilege to welcome you back. Uh, to Tel Aviv University. We feel that you're an old friend by now. Uh, it's lovely to have you uh, with us again. Um, and I want to begin by congratulating you for uh, receiving the very prestigious Dan David Award. Um, it's an honor, well deserved, another acknowledgement of the high esteem with which your work is uh, held, uh, not just where you live in the United States, but all over the world. Um, and you, last night you gave a very, uh, to me it was a very powerful and moving speech at the Dan David uh, Award Ceremony. And one sentence that you said uh, really stayed with me, and I'm paraphrasing, I hope I'm not uh, paraphrasing it uh, wrongly, but you said something like, I hate the language of English, but it's the only language I have. Yes. Um, and of course to all of you uh, here in the audience who've read um, Jamaica's work and know something about her, uh, life, uh, this sentence doesn't come as complete surprise. Uh, you grew up uh, in Antigua in the 1950s and 60s. It was still a British colony. Yes. Antigua, the island in the West Indies, was a British uh, colony until 1981, yes. I believe. Yes, yes. And so as you were growing up, and the children who were growing up in Antigua uh, with you, really were raised on a, on a language and a culture and a historical narrative that was, uh, that was foreign to them. Yes. Um, that, that came from a country very far away, England, uh, where they've never been. That's right. Uh, and this is something that you talk about, I think, uh, uh, very memorably in your early novels, such as Annie John, where the protagonist is a young girl who is punished for defacing the, the picture of Christopher Columbus in her history book, and her punishment is to copy large sections from Paradise Lost. 
uh, or in, in Lucy, where uh, the heroine uh, talks about the irony of seeing the daff daffodils, the flowers, for the first time at the age of 19, after she had to memorize this Wordsworth poem about the daffodils uh, when she was 10, but never saw that flower because it doesn't exist in, in Antigua. So I wanted to uh, maybe begin by asking you, what does it mean to write in a language that you hate and yet is the only language that you have? Oh, what does it mean? Um, uh, is that your camera? It's very distracting. Uh, um, uh, let me see, what does it mean? Um, well, a, lo a lot of things. It, uh, uh, but let me see if I can start with it. First of all, I want to say that that uh, situation you describe uh, of learning about um, England uh, would be true for every child uh, in the British Empire, so that, I don't know if you've ever heard of a Calypsonian named the Mighty Sparrow, he would have had the same education, or Wooly Soyinka um, would have had the same, or someone growing up in uh, what was Rhodesia, uh, now Zimbabwe, would have had um, that education. In many ways, it was uh, a very good education if you were an English child uh, of a certain economic background. It was an education designed by the foreign office, and people in that office usually had gone to Eton and a school like that, and then Cambridge and so on. Um, so, in a way, you know, we we were uh, uh, there, let me see how to put it, we were um, expressions of their uh, creativity. They didn't know what to do with themselves other than to make us into adherents to English culture, British culture, though we never call it British, we always called it English. We forgot about Scotland and Wales. Um, uh, but, um, an, an interesting thing about our education is that we knew, uh, for instance, I knew a lot about Roman Britain. Uh, I just knew a lot about it. Uh, why? I don't know what I uh, would do with it, except in my case it led me uh, to a love of history and a love of uh, studying how empires behave or how, or the aspiration uh, uh, to empire. I, I'm coming back to uh, the language uh, issue. Um, uh, con the lang in the language issue, uh, conquered people often develop two personalities. The uh, personality, I think Franz Fanon called it black skin, white mask, uh, um, or uh, W.E. Du Bois called it uh, something else, but we developed two persons. Pardon? Double consciousness. Double consciousness, that's right. So we develop a way of living uh, and aspiring to be uh, a person in the conquering um, uh, power, and then we live among ourselves in a culture we are in the middle of creating, either through memory. Um, and in your case, you can see it in something like Yiddish um, or the culture that came out of the place called uh, the Pale, a kind of no man's land, um, which was a land for people. Um, something comes out of it. Human beings always make, try to make something, always trying to uh, create ourselves. Um, the self we are is sort of a blank to us, and then we make something of it through language, through our imagination. So for me, growing up um, with this language, English, in, which I... Uh, I had to speak all all the time. There was another language that we were developing called Creole, or broken English, or bad English. Those were the three words for it. Broken, bad English, um, uh, Creole. But I wasn't allowed to speak it in school, or in front of my parents, or adults, really. Mm -hmm. Though they spoke it all the time, too. Maybe that's uh, one difference between a child growing up in Rhodesia or in other places who received the same kind of education as you did, but possibly had another language uh, in, in which to live outside of 
life in the public sphere. I'm thinking maybe of an analogous situation here in Israel. You know, we have um, the, the kind of a recent phenomenon, or not so recent anymore, um, Arab Israeli writers who write in Hebrew. They choose to write in the language of the public sphere, but they always have recourse to Arabic at the same time, from which they can dig up phrases and use it in order to problematize the language of Hebrew. But you didn't have that. You only had English. That's and right. But and, and to go back, uh, the comparison between uh, Arabs and uh, someone in Rhodesia, a Rhodesian, an African in, uh, in Rhodesia, um, would have had uh, a history in the place in which they live. The trouble for the, not trouble, the problem or whatever you want to call it, for the uh, African in the New World um, is that they come from different places in Africa, where in Africa they might have been enemies even, um, don't speak the same language, don't have the same culture. In fact, not only might they have been enemies, they might have sold each other into slavery. That's something that is not much recognized, that perhaps the slave trade in the New World would not have been so successful if Africans hadn't cooperated in it. Um, of course, they didn't understand the slavery that they were uh, a part of was different from the slavery they had among themselves. In any case, um, the African in the uh, West Indies or in the New World, in, in uh, America even, had to create um, an identity, a culture. Uh, in the American case, they were not only denied language, they were denied, it was illegal for them to know how to read. Um, and so therefore right. It was, you were forbidden, it was against um, the law. So they ha did a whole set of creative things that are in some ways unique to them. Um, we in the uh, British Island, English owned islands, um, didn't have that kind of oppression. And uh, um, so, did not develop the kind of infra cultural infrastructure uh, that Amer African Americans did. And we didn't, not because we couldn't, but it wasn't necessary for us to. Um, but anyway, uh, we have never, in the English speaking uh, countries, have never claimed a language the way, say, the French speaking countries. They, they, uh, the, in the French West Indies, the islands there have developed a Creole, which is now recognized as a language, um, an official language. So that at Derek Walcott's funeral, it was broadcast in both English and Creole. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have that in the uh, English-speaking West Indies, in spite of Bob Marley. <laughs> I would say. Maybe if we can stay with the, the islands in Antigua uh, for a few minutes. Yes. Um, I'm always struck by the, the very different and even dichotomous representations of the island that appear in your various uh, works. On the one hand, Antigua is, is paradise. It's paradise lost. Uh, it's, a, it's this beautiful, natural, place uh, that you remember very fondly and with a lot of love. On the <coughs> other hand, in such books as uh, A Small Place, you seem to be taking a step backwards and to look at it more objectively and to uh, highlight uh, current problems in Antigua, poverty, corruption. Um, so it's a very different island that emerges from, from, that, uh, from that book. And of course, I think we all have a kind of a, an ambivalent relation to the place where we grew up. But in your particular case, um, it seems to be particularly complex. And also, this is a place you come back to again and again and again in your yes. writing. <clears throat> um, so, I'm sorry. I, I don't know why I'm having this problem with my. Uh, yes, I am drinking it. Um, I, I've never understood why uh, things are one or the other. Everything is both. Sometimes it's three, four, five uh, uh, different things, um, all of them true, all of them in contrast, but yet um, true. I, I uh, sometimes, um, uh, when I'm thinking in my head about this, um, usually it has to do with memory, and I'm remem reminded that um, uh, memory is the mother of nine daughters. I always thought there wasn't some boys in it, but uh, no. Uh, and she has nine daughters, and they were born on nine different days, so you can imagine 
um, they have one thing, a true, a true mother, but they must have different uh, experiences and they're all true, but they're, they're different. And, and these nine daughters are the pillars of, uh, mostly of civilization, um, of, of most things you consider uh, a civilization. And if you look at <laughs> these pillars, uh, they are very uh, conflicting, very um, uh, different, but they're all uh, true. So when I speak, uh, about Antigua as a paradise, in my mind uh, also is the idea that paradise always inevitably contains hell. Uh, so um, it's not a contradiction. It's a, I, I'm always trying to tell uh, uh, something true, uh, but it doesn't mean that the truth, in fact, the truth is, is the most complicated thing because uh, a lie is usually like a dead piece of coal. It just flops to the ground. It doesn't move. It has no life in it. But the truth is, um, it's dynamic. It's, it's, uh, it's complicated. It's all true, but it doesn't lead to one whole malefic mellifluous chorus. Uh, um, it's a very difficult uh, thing, the truth. Um, and is it that complexity that also leads you to return again and again in, in your prose? Yes, to, to this paradise that contains hell. Um, if you go back to the original story, which I, I, I use the creation story a lot in, in many different ways because it seems to um, we seem to replicate the social part of it in everyday life. Mm -hmm. the, the garden story, which is, it's only three little lines, but it's so fantastic. How has Antigua changed over the years? Do you still recognize the same island that you write about when you go back now? Oh, no. Um, I, don't, I don't recognize it, but I don't... Uh, I used to be so critical of it um, until uh, January 20th. 2017, um, I realized that, uh, for instance, the book A Small Place in which I criticize Antiguans and their corrupt government uh, practices, and um, I uh, would have held up, um, you know, America as a, a, not a kleptocracy and not a banana republic and not a this, not a that, and why can't Antiguans be more like civic-minded like, uh, in terms of government, uh, uh, like America, until January 20th, 2017. <laughs> um, but now Antiguans uh, can say to me, well, ha, ha, ha. Um, you know, their uh, prime minister is practically a saint compared to uh, the person. Oh, can you please keep him? <laughs> Yes, but you're used to dealing with people like that. <laughs> it's very new for us to have an openly stupid person in. No, I think we, we share your kind of new sense of uh, despair vis-a-vis -vis the United States. Oh, uh, recent months, uh, yes, um, yes. Yeah, but you've been living in the United States for for very oh, many for very years. long a long time, and I, I feel uh, there again, um, uh, you know, and uh, uh, not ambivalence, but a, t a two uh, 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 two two lanes I travel. I'm a uh, Caribbean um, American, and I'm an African American. Um, by I'm an Antiguan American, um, but I very much in in some way take on uh, the narrative of, of an African-American, because mostly that is the way, not mostly, that is the way anyone, I walk out in the street and uh, sees me and will say I'm an African-American, and so therefore all the things that, uh, I, I often forget, not often, I completely uh, forget that I look the way I look. Essentially, I think everyone looks like me, and uh, because I grew up in which every, a place where everyone looks like me, and I never quite lost that. Um, so I think, oh, everyone looks like me, and then I notice slight changes, and then I say, oh, they don't look like you. And that's, a, that's 
one difference uh, between that, your experience and the African American. That's people. right. That that but they are much more aware of it. And and I uh, I've studied African American. Uh, history uh, uh, a lot so that I understand the responses to my appearance to people who are not African uh, American. So I would identify myself as African American when um, I'm in America. Actually on the whole I don't I like to identify myself. I've become uh, less and less enchanted with the idea of identity. It, it, it seems to uh, give, uh, cultivating it seems to me to give me a kind of um, idea about myself that I don't like. Fortunately, uh, any identity I would cultivate about myself uh, doesn't have much power. But if I were to cultivate an identity or could uh, make an identity for myself of um, uh, a white American, say, um, the things I would do um, would be horrifying. So uh, um, I don't, yeah, I, I'm not in in love with identities anymore. Why do you um, say that an identity would not have given you much power? Well, I'm an African American. Uh, even Africans think African Americans are not to be taken seriously. <laughs> it's a very, it's a very strange thing. Oh, when I, I think we need to oh, a bit I'm sorry. Um, uh, Afri Afri one of the reasons I identify myself as African American is that uh, people who are black from other places, when they go uh, to America, are very condescending uh, to African Americans. They can't understand why they do this or why they do uh, uh, that. And then they soon realize that it doesn't matter where you come from. If you're black, eventually you are going to be shot by the police if the police can shoot you. Um, ask Amadillo. Diallo, who was just standing outside his uh, apartment smoking a cigarette. So, um, yeah, but uh, I, I, I no longer feel, um, I, I, yeah, identity is not, though I know it's a very big, uh, and, and understandably so, a very big um, idea, a, a formative idea. Um, of uh, uh, Israel, um, but I, I'm not so in love uh, with I identity for myself. I, I understand it for other people, but uh, for me, I feel, um, what is it? Derek says, um, either I am a country or I am nothing, and I sometimes feel uh, I am nothing. I, I can live with that. Um, countries seem to do things that I don't really want to do, so, you know. Yeah, maybe I can ask you um, uh, whether that would be true also in terms of your identity as an author, because one of the things that I um, uh, thought would be interesting to discuss is the fact that you have now been kind of enshrined or canonized as part of that thing we call American literature, uh -huh. right? You came to the United States when you were 16, so you've been there for a few decades now, and you became a writer very quickly and yes. successful very quickly. Yeah, and uh, and I think that now, you know, uh, very often we find your work in, uh, in literary anthologies that are anthologies um, of American literature. Um, your, your your work get, gets taught in uh, introductions to American literature, such as the one that some of the students sitting here are participating in. And so I was wondering, um, you know, if we kind of pull that aside from the question of personal identity, but in terms of the identity of your writing, uh -huh. do you feel comfortable being within this category, or are there other categories that you find um, um, more appropriate or more uh, descriptive of your work in a better way? Ah, um, well, I don't really care what category I'm placed in. If you would like to place me in Israeli literature, I wouldn't mind at all. I'd be very honored. Um, or Jewish literature, if if only because um, my writing itself and and my um, a great part of my moral world. Uh, when I'm writing is very much formed by the Bible, uh, albeit the King James Version. 
Um, it was the book I had to read as a child. I had, um, you know, children's books and so on, but it was the book I read uh, uh, the most, especially what we called um, the Old Testament. Um, I never much liked the Gospels because it was just full of these personalities. Um, and of course, uh, Paul was, who had been Saul, was very harsh and unpleasant. Um, but I did like Revelations, which is a very thrilling thing for a child to read. Uh, so if you'd like to put me in, um, I was uh, in, in uh, Jewish literature because I'm very influenced by the Bible. I was one day, uh, one day, the the rabbi in our synagogue was reading something, and he said, um, uh, "Who would begin a sentence with and? Isn't this awesome? This book, the sentence begins with and." And I said, "But I do." <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, and I understand why the Bible has the conjunction um, in it, or at least I feel I, I do. There might be other, uh, I'm sure there are other explanations, but I think the conjunction means that um, there is no beginning, middle, and end. It's all that beautiful phrase, continuity, contiguity, contiguity. Where is, is it? Mr. Professor Miron gave me that idea. It will never leave me now. <laughs> He'll be sorry he spoke to me. <laughs> the ways in which I will deploy that idea. Um, but yes, as for I, uh, where to put me in, in literature, I'm happy uh, to be read in any category, in any language. I, I, if it's American literature, Caribbean literature, um, sometimes I'm in Chinese. Uh, I, it, it really, these categories um, seem uh, uh, a part of the marketing department, but not a part of literature. I think. The question of where your book is placed. Yes, the, yes, the where, uh, yes yeah. where the publisher will sell more books, mm -hmm. uh, where it fits some um, curator's idea. But I, I, I couldn't, uh, I remember talking to a writer from St. Kitts who had gone to England, and he was, he's in the African American anthology, and he said, why am I in the African American anthology? And I thought, I didn't say that to him, but I thought, you should be glad you're in any anthology. <laughs> uh, because, you know, we West Indians don't really um, read. If I were to depend on an Antiguan audience to read me, I wouldn't be read at all. They hate my books. <laughs> Why do they hate your books? Oh, because I tell them things they wished I wouldn't. <laughs> they don't like to hear some things. About themselves. About themselves or about myself or, or they, they uh, yeah, they don't really, uh, really like it, and I again I see um, uh, the influence of a certain book on my writing. A lot of those people in in those books in that book I was reading, uh, the people didn't like them either. My favorite way of uh, speaking about what the life of an author is mm, not favorite, but it's a, a, an example I take great comfort in is. Um, uh, you know, the uh, Apostle Paul was always writing these letters to the, oh, the various Lations, the Corinthians, the this, the that, and nobody ever listened to him. None of them ever read the letters to them. Um, but where are those people today? On the other hand, there's that annoying Paul still, <laughs> and very much read, and so that's my model for a writer. The, <laughs> The people you write for won't like you at all, but the people to come might. And it's to come that you want to be, to come, all that is to come. Yeah. And that, that brings us to a question that I know you get asked a lot. Yes. Um, and if you wouldn't mind talking about it some more, I'd appreciate it. That is um, the accusation that is often leveled against you, that you write in anger. That oh. is that those readers who sometimes, or in, in relation to certain books, felt uncomfortable by your writing, said, well, she's an angry writer. Uh, this happened, of course, with this small, in this small place, yes. where uh, yeah. you know, it was, wasn't particularly pleasant for uh, white affluent uh, tourists who come yes. to places like Antigua yes. in order to have a good time, uh, to, be, um, to see themselves in the mirror of your uh, writing uh, as uh, 
obnoxious, yeah. uh, <laughs> self-interested, oblivious uh, people. And so after that uh, essay was published originally in the New Yorker, I know a lot of readers actually accused you of being too angry. Yes. And then I thought that this kind of criticism kind of went away until your most recent uh, novel, uh, where you write, we'll, we'll come back to it a little bit later, but this is a novel where you write about a couple who are getting a divorce, and it's a bitter divorce, and there are a lot of uh, uh, emotions, uh, harsh emotions expressed in that book. And once again, sure enough, reviewers begin to say it's an angry book, it's acidic, it's, uh, it's bitter. Um, Adjectives that you don't uh, usually, I think, find in relation to uh, male authors who are writing about anger or angry young men or are being lauded for being angry and expressing that anger. Um, and then yesterday in the, in the ceremony, we saw a little video of your, some interviews with you, and you said, but I'm not an angry writer. Uh, so do you think you're being misread as angry? What is anger for you? Oh, um... Oh, anger is not something that comes in to me when I'm, I'm writing. I'm usually seeking to portray some version of a truth um, that, I, uh, that I know. But uh, to go back, uh, the anger accusation, I think, um, started uh, with Annie John, of all things, because she uh, it's sometimes read as a coming-of-age uh, coming book. And um, the little rebellion she shows uh, um, seems to be disturbing uh, to people. I think that one one thing uh, that uh, the American public um, is not used to is an examination of a black person as an individual, as someone who um, has private thoughts and is just a private person, who isn't always interacting with the larger historical narrative of being black. Um, the people are, I write about clearly are black, but I never say so because I don't, no one ever says uh, in, uh, they're white, I, uh, they just assume they're white, I assume people are black. Um, so, uh, there was a little, there's always a little uh, a bit of annoyance with me um, that I uh, didn't write uh, about a certain, uh, uh, my characters didn't experience the world in a certain way. They experienced the sun as hot because the sun can be hot in a place like that. Not that the, there's a special sun made only for black people. Um, so that, for instance, uh, I don't know if you know the cover um, of this book, it's, uh, it, it, it's worth analyzing. It's a little black girl in a schoolroom, and um, she's kept, the, the, the painting is called Kept In, and she's obviously been bad, so she's been kept in from recess. You can't hear me? I sometimes, you're shaking your head. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So she's been kept inside uh, because she's she's bad, and you can see her clothes are torn. Uh, she looks dejected. She's sort of a Lucifer, a fallen figure. Um, outside are her playmates in um, uh, the sunlight, and they're all in white. They're black too, but they are angelic, and they are in the they are in the blessed light. And she's in the dark room with knowledge. There's a map on the wall. She's reflecting. Um, I, for a long time, I didn't know if the painter was black or white, and I asked someone, and she said the painter would be white because a, a black painter of that period would not show a black person in disgrace. Um, so you see, there's another way this horrible situation impinges on the individual uh, imagination. Anyway, um, so the uh, accusation of anger began a little bit with Annie John. With Lucy, it was, uh, well, she was just so angry because why isn't this black young immigrant girl uh, happy to be in, I don't know, um, and why is she writing about their affairs? That was another thing, uh, as a subtext to it, is that uh, the, uh, most readers had, 
first of all, I don't say Lucy is black, so the conflict she has uh, regarding the family is not particularly racial. It's not racial at all. It's just uh, this immigrant girl and these well-off people. And the fact that she regards them in such a way as other. Uh, most Americans are not used to black people, most white Americans are not used to black people thinking of them as the other. Um, otherness is a category for the disempowered. Uh, the powerful makes an other of the disempowered. What I suspect was new about it uh, was that no one really understood that the disempowered is making an other of the powerful too. These things go both ways. Uh, the powerless are not powerless. And they express their, their powerfulness in ways that we find despicable and is despicable sometimes, but they're not powerless. The powerless are not powerless. Uh, so Lucy was the first book that um, was judged to be angry. Uh, a Small Place was, was judged to be uh, an angry book because no one from my part of the world had ever said, hey, this is what uh, has happened. Also, I think it was the first uh, book, I don't want to say the first book, it was a book that exposed the thing we now call globalization in its early phase and how brutal uh, it was, globalization. The globalization, the trading of African bodies is the beginning of the thing we call uh, globalization. So there was that. Then, oh, autobiography of my mother was judged angry too. I remember someone reviewing it and saying it was the ugliest book in the most beautiful language they'd ever read. <laughs> um, and then, oh, the last book was just, uh, um, uh, I, everyone just said it was so angry. I couldn't see anything angry about it at all. I thought it was, I was trying, I, I wasn't really writing about the divorces uh, so much, a divorce so much as I was trying to understand the thing we call time. That's the main character in the book. Is uh, what is time? You know, uh, I was reading a lot of geology. I was reading a lot of um, a lot of strange things about the Earth. I became very interested in how the Earth was made. Um, you know, so at one point I read somewhere it rained for 100 million years to create the atmosphere we live in. And I went up to uh, a scientist and I said, when they say 100 million w years, do they mean 365, 100 million? No answer, because it was such a stupid question, he thought. <laughs> um, but uh, so I just became interested in, the, in, in, in time. What is, what is time? What is... Uh, I, I can feel, I, do, I can't say for, for certainty, but I can feel that the thing we call time is completely indifferent to us. And, uh, yeah. uh, and so what do we make of it? How do we, um, you know, divide it and uh, uh, arrange it and, and the way we try to capture it? And then, of course, after we are gone, it will be indifferent to our presence and so on. So that's essentially what I was contemplating as I wrote about this family uh, in New England um, having a terrible uh, uh, time. And then the, I would, to counter that, counterpoint uh, that, I would make the, the family very domestic, but I gave them very uh, unusual names. The son is named Heracles, and the daughter is named Persephone, and they have the uh, traits of those mythical people. And uh, the mother is um, perhaps a wounded Hera, a permanently wounded Hera. Oh, Oh, med ah. No, I think she's, uh, yeah, she doesn't bring the house down. She doesn't uh, boil the children and feed them to someone. She doesn't do, she's just a very sad, she's a defeated person, um, as, as love often defeats women uh, or leaves them feeling shattered. But um, 
Uh, and the father is, you know, one of those um, wounded gods and so on. It was, I was trying to understand a lot of things other than anger. Um, you know, but uh, men write books all the, uh, I mean, Norman Mailer stabbed his wife uh, uh, because he thought if he didn't, he, w he would get cancer. He actually did eventually get cancer. <laughs> so stabbing his wife did him no good at all. Uh, maybe uh, we can stay for a minute with- uh, Oh, please, please. Uh, with but does it make, uh, do, are you following uh, what I'm saying? Okay, all right. Um, Part of uh, your interesting time in that book, uh, for me, as I read it, uh, was connected to a certain tradition, uh, in, particularly in English literature. Uh -huh. And that is uh, the modernist tradition. That is, oh. you have a book that is centered around not people exactly, but consciousness says, uh, particularly of Mrs. Sweet, uh, the, the mother and wife of the story. Um, but also of, of uh, Mr. Sweet to some extent. And then your, your investigation of time has to do also with your investigation of their consciousness of time in an almost, I would say, Proust-like way or Joycean or, you know, the, the clearest association for me is Virginia Woolf. Um, and I wanted to know whether that was something that was on your mind as you were thinking about this question of, you know, memories, how, how alive memories are in our consciousness in the present. What does it mean to learn that things that you went through in your life were actually very different from what you imagined them to be at the time? Oh. And discovering later on that uh, uh, whatever you thought about yourself and your family was actually wrong. These kind of questions to me yes. are very modest. Yeah. Oh, oh, really? Um, huh. uh, I, didn't, I didn't know that. But you know, when you think of um, as I say, the big influence on me is, is the Bible, and uh, when you think of it, it it's a, I often think, oh, it's so modern. It's, um, it's not an old book at all, because, uh, you know, it, well, just um, for instance, uh, uh, the f creation story, well, if you, the very beginning, set the separating of the heavens and, and earth, and and uh, and then at the end, uh, God rested. No, I hope I'm not violating people's traditions by. Um, I'm speaking of this as a writer uh, who's read. Um, so forgive me if I'm trampling on something special to you. Um, but. It, it occurred to me, I mean, and I've read it over and over, as I say, I had nothing else to read. Uh, once it occurred to me that the um, the one day was really a, uh, not one day as we know it at all, but uh, and that mistakes, as Donald Rumsfeld said, were made um, over <laughs> that it the the separation uh, didn't occur in this one day. That must have uh, some days, it, uh, some attempts, let's say, uh, to make this first separation must not have gone so well. And so, um, but it would be very mu much of a modernist thing to just collapse it into and one day and move on to the next. But many things must have happened uh, in between, and then the second day, and then uh, all of that is. If you begin to look into it, you see there's something much more interesting going on about time, and. Um, uh, so uh, modern, it, it seems very natural to me, regardless of Virginia Woolf and, and Joyce and so on. I, I, I love Virginia Woolf, but I would never have said she uh, was an influence. I would have said my fascination or obsession with how, how it came to be would start, have started with the Bible, um, would have, yeah, um, what, what does it mean? And I, I actually have now built such, uh, in a lot of my th work, recent work is bu built into it is lots of analysis or inspiration from just the uh, creation of the Garden of Eden, um, which, uh, oh, shall I tell you, I mean, just for instance, um, 
uh, I became interested in, in gardening itself, but could see that gardening culture is really, uh, as we know it, is really represented in that little creation of Eden. Just for instance, the relationship between the gardener, God, and the garden is as complicated as it is in that book. But also that the arrangement of the trees, the tree of life, the tree of knowledge, which I interpret as the tree, uh, the tree of life being agriculture, the tree of knowledge being horticulture. And that it is true that in gardens, uh, the uh, development of gardens, Gardens, people make gardens after they have a lot to eat, after the life is abundant. Then they begin to make uh, horticulture, begin to arrange a garden in which it is not necessary for life, in um, physical life, but it becomes necessary for uh, contemplation and uh, therefore wondering, imagining um, of the world. So I can find, uh, uh, oh, but then the most important uh, revelation to me was the naming of things uh, uh, by Adam. And I can give you a whole um, interpretation. I've written about it in, uh, when I write about gardens. But the naming of things, um, uh, which comes about in the Enlightenment, the naming, uh, which is codified by Linnaeus, the, the binomial system, is a very Adam-like thing. Um, and uh, the binomial system gets codified permanently through some plants that came from the New World. And so they had no names. And Linnaeus found them in... Uh, greenhouse by a, uh, owned by a banker named George Clifford. And the, he's not just a banker, he's an Anglo-Dutch uh, banker in charge of the Dutch East India Company. So you begin to see, uh, which means he must have been trading in slaves and so on. So you begin to see how uh, the world we live in gets formed and you can see a line of it uh, in the creation story, the naming of things, the codification of things. And uh, it, it, uh, it seems to me that the naming of things is perhaps the most important thing in the history of conquest. That when you name something, you possess it and you empty it of all that it was before. Columbus and it, named Antigua. Columbus named Antigua, the naming of plants, uh, whatever indigenous people, whatever Mexicans called Dahlia, Dahlia, you know Dahlia? Whatever they called it, it's no longer that. It's called Dahlia because it's named after Andreas Dahl, who was a fabulous student of Carolus Linnaeus. Um, Zinnia. Uh, ev almost everything, uh, the, the, the naming of the world becomes codified through uh, this system that Linnaeus developed. And he first developed it in, from uh, uh, things that had no names according to him. And so you can find that in, in that creation story, the possession of something comes through naming it. To name is to claim, essentially. Um, you know, Columbus had no way of claiming these islands in the, uh, except to name them. And of course, uh, if you begin to look at the naming of things, what did he, he named things after uh, things he was familiar with. He was familiar with, um, uh, the landscape of Spain or the landscape of par parts of his past, and he named things after them. And in that way, the past of these islands was erased. So St. Kitts is named after St. Christopher because in Columbus's mind, it looked like the narrative of St. Christopher and the child Christ. And so all of this, whatever St. Kitts was before, is not uh, relevant anymore. Very important to name things is to claim them, is to possess them, and you empty them of everything that they were, and they begin with you. Yes, and of course, you in your own garden, uh, you don't name, you grow things, and gardening is very important for you. Yes, uh, you've written a lot about gardening uh, in in the book called uh, My Garden Book, as well as in other places. 
Um, again, I'm sorry if I'm attributing an influence to you that is only in my mind and not in yours. Oh, yours, not at all. When I was reading my garden book, uh, my thoughts were with uh, Henry David Thoreau. Oh, uh, yes. Some of the yes. chapter headings seem to be ah. uh, mimetic of his chapter headings, like yes. reading. He huh. has a chapter called uh, uh, The Garden in Winter, and he has a chapter called The Ponds in Winter. Oh. And <laughs> in any case, Thoreau, for Thoreau, gardening had a very clear uh, purpose, and this is a quote from Thoreau. He said, he worked in the garden, quote, if only for the sake of tropes and expression to serve as a parable maker one day. Amazing. Um, so he's, he's Growing these plants, and he's looking at the roots, but it's the roots of words and of of, uh, of expressions that he is he's he's after. Um, how do garden and gardening and writing come together for you? I know that oh. you talked a little bit about the special uh, shape of the garden that you created. Yes, first time yes. Tried to create a garden. Maybe, maybe you can talk a little bit about. Oh, that. The, uh, on, uh, when I was first making a garden, you know, people make a garden and they have uh, a square bed, this and a that. Uh, um, I noticed after a while that I was making a garden that looked very much like a map of the Caribbean. You know, a little island here. They were all rounded. They were not uh, squared, and they they were isolated and you had to cross a little patch of grass the way you'd have to cross a, you know, some water or something. It was totally unconscious, nothing uh, uh, I meant to, to do at all and uh, I've, I've left it that way. But, um, you know, uh, it, it seems to me that I'm, and I've accepted it now, that I'm not really uh, making a garden, I'm writing when I'm uh, planting things. I know the history of every uh, plant, I, I, where it comes from, what it's like, you know. Um, I've gone looking for plants in Nepal. Um, plants sometimes I can't grow, but just to see them. Um, yeah, it's a, uh, yes, I've become that sort of person. <laughs> um, but, yeah, the garden uh, for me is um, it's l another form of writing. Well, you have to read about the things, you know, nothing uh, is more pleasurable than reading plant catalogues in, in winter. In fact, we had such an unusual winter that uh, long, you know, that I kept making a garden in my head, another garden uh, in my head um, through catalogues. And so about two weeks ago, all the things I ordered came and I'd completely forgotten that I'd ordered them and I don't have any place to put them, just plants after plants because I'd, I'd been so desperate to be in the garden and there was, it was just winter so I just made up this, uh, this garden and ordered from it. And the, the, that's a, uh, an extraordinary uh, pleasure because you, you read, uh, you know, about, about these things, you read, um, you know, it led me the garden. You are asking, mentioning Thoreau. It led me the, in the garden to read about um, uh, to get involved with Thomas Jefferson, and I teach a course on Thomas Jefferson and the and the African American. And and the reason I started um, there is a plant named after Thomas Jefferson called uh, Jeffersonia diffila. I think it's. Diphila, not diphila. Diphila would be di, so it's diphila, and it's a plant that has one leaf, but the leaf is divided in two. Uh, each half of the leaf is not identical. Each each half is different. So if you put them together, they wouldn't form the perfect leaf. And I thought, how amazing was it that someone uh, named a plant? after this person before they knew that this was how he would be described as a divided person on, uh, on even Jeffersonia diaphyl. Uh, the common name for it is twin leaf. Um, but so I would begin to think about that and then I would go and read Jefferson's farm and, and garden book. He kept a record of his uh, farm and his garden. Interesting this. The garden book has no people in it. It's, I planted this, he would say, I plant peas, peas were planted on this day. Three, <clears throat> four, five weeks later, peas arrive at table. So there is no person who planted the peas, and believe me, it was not him. And there is no person who reaped the peas, uh, cooked them, and brought them to table. There is no person in the garden book. 
in the farm book is a list of all the people he owned and what they uh, wore, how much uh, uh, food they needed in a year, new blankets, new shoes, all the names uh, of the people. And I always thought that was an incredible thing that he kept the garden free of the sin that he was committing. Um, it's uh, purged of that. So uh, I then from that began to read a lot of him, um, his autobiography, his, which is only 100 pages long. Imagine that. Um, you know, so the, yes, the garden for me is a form of reading and writing. I uh, do my own writing in it, and I do other kinds of writing. And uh, reading, I come across something, and I start to um, investigate, which is how I come to know a lot about Carolus Linnaeus. Yeah. And the other thing, you know, about being in the garden is that I'm not afraid to uh, get involved in things that will be of no use to me, really. I read a lot of things. I, I for instance, can give you a, a satisfying lecture on the history of Mount Everest climb. <laughs> climbing in Mount Everest, which came out of the garden. I became interested in a, a famous plant hunter who had tried to climb Mount Everest many times and failed. And uh, then he wrote a book about uh, his flower collecting. And uh, so I, I, through him, I became interested in um, mountaineering literature. I never want to climb a mountain. I just like to read about people who have. Um, but, but, you know, I will never do anything with all this mountaineering uh, reading I've done and, um, you know, but, but strangely it is connected to something I'm interested in, which is conquest. Um, yeah, I'm very interested in conquest. Not all information is useful information. And as you say about Jefferson, there is the, the farm, right, the utilitarian space where things get yes, used and yes. people are listed as objects, and then there is the garden, which can be his retreat from that. Yes. As you said, a space for contemplation. Yes. Uh, thinking about uh, gardening as writing, uh, which is kind of a non, a spatial rather than a linear or chronological way of thinking about writing, mm. uh, brings me to ask you about um, a very distinctive feature of your writing style. Um, and maybe the best way for me to ask that question is to ask you, if you don't mind, to yes. read uh, the first quite long sentence of your book, uh, Mr. Potter. Oh. Uh, this is your book about uh, your biological father. Yes. Your moving book. Uh, it begins, by the way, with the word and, and I yes. believe. So yes, it does. So it harks back to your comments from before. And uh, the first uh, sentence is pretty much the first page of the book. <laughs> um, I, I should tell you that I'm also criticized anger and her long sentences uh, is... Um, a very good company with long sentences. I would... Uh, well, I've noticed that people have started to write long sentences. Uh, um, and that day, the sun was in its usual place, up, above, and in the middle of the sky, and it shone in its usual way, so harshly bright, making even the shadows pale, making even the shadows seek shelter. That day the sun was in its usual place, up, above, and in the middle of the sky, but Mr. Potter did not note this, so accustomed was he to this, the sun in its usual place, up, above, and in the middle of the sky. If the sun had not been in its usual place, that would have made a great big change in Mr. Potter's day. It would have meant rain, however briefly such a thing, rain might fall, but it would have changed Mr. Potter's day, so used was he to the sun in its usual place, way up above and in the middle of the sky. Mr. Potter breathed in his normal way. His heart was beating in its normal way up and down underneath the covering of his black skin, up and down underneath his white knitted cotton vest next to his very black skin, up and down underneath his plainly woven white cotton shirt that was on top of the knitted cotton vest which lay next to his skin. So his heart breathed in its normal way. 
and he put on his trousers, and in the pocket of his trousers, he placed a white handkerchief, and all this was as normal as the way his heart beat. All this, his putting on his clothes is in just that way, as normal as the way his heart beat, the heart beating normally, and the clothes reassuring to Mr. Potter and to things beyond Mr. Potter, things that did not know they needed such reassurance. To be fair, this is not all one sentence. <laughs> So oh. that this, this, um, um, it's pretty long sentence, but yes. not all of it, yes. It, it's long, and it's, it goes in circles. Repetition. Does it remind you of anything? Are you going to say the Bible again? Yes. yes you are. Okay. <laughs> uh, and I wasn't thinking, uh, this is, I wasn't thinking about the Bible at all. I'm never thinking about any other uh, writing when I'm writing, but it turns out that that influence, the Bible and the other thing, uh, Perhaps three things are the biggest influence. The Bible. Um, my mother gave me, for my seventh birthday, a, small, a concise Oxford dictionary. Uh, it was the most concise of concise. And I read it. And I think that that would account for my uh, repetition of words and using the same words to mean something else within the same sentence. Um, I would say that the dictionary would be that. And of course, Paradise Lost, which, as you can imagine, I identified with that fallen angel, um, Lucifer. And um, the name Lucy in Lucifer comes from, from that. Is this, is this uh, if you would like to leave, don't hesitate. I, I don't blame you. Um, so, yes, that lo long sentence. Yeah, this, and uh, it's, to me, it's almost like incantation, these repetitions. I didn't think of the Bible, I thought of something that comes out of the realm of ritual and, uh, you know, kind of ritualistic repetition of the same yes. words again and again. Yes. Uh, which do accumulate more and more meanings the more you, you repeat them. Yes. Um, but it's a very distinctive style and, you know, I, I think the same, uh, the same style is also very evident in, um, in a, a See Now then. then, which I would also like you to read a little bit from uh, in a second, but let me just ask you perhaps one uh, last question before um, I ask you to read uh, from your, more recent, um, your most recent novel. Um, and that is to go back to the, the topic of uh, readership. Yes. Um, your book, uh, My Brother, yes. uh, which I find to be perhaps your most moving book uh, to me, which narrates the story of your brother's uh, death um, from AIDS. Um, the entire book really is a kind of an elegy for your, for your brother. But it ends with an elegy to another person, and yes. that is to, to William uh, Shawn, the legendary editor of The New Yorker. And you say about him that he was your perfect reader. Yes. And now that he's gone, uh, you no longer have that perfect reader. So I wanted to ask, uh, did you find another reader? Are you still writing for him? Um, yes, you yes, are? Yes, yes. Yeah. I still wish uh, somewhere he reads it. Um, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. he, he was uh, not just my... Uh, perfect reader. The group of we were the last uh, group of writers, young writers that he um, nurtured. I think is is a good word for it. Um, and uh, we would write something and send it to him, and just sit in our offices waiting for the phone to ring. And sometimes it would, and sometimes it wouldn't. And if it didn't, you never heard about the piece again, and uh, uh, you never brought it up. Uh, but if you, if he liked it, he would ring you up, or might even come down to your office and tell you how great it is. And he would make you think you were the best. Ri Every writer thought he thought they were the best of all the writers, and we didn't mind that it that he was not telling us the truth. It was just. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's, wonderful. It's like a parent who tells yes. like every child, you are my I love favorite. you. Yes, yes, yes. yes. It was yeah. quite, uh, it was quite something. Mm -hmm. So it's not hard for you to have to write for a person who is was in not a position there. of authority for yes. you. And, uh, it wasn't so much authority, but uh, love. He loved us. And um, it was, uh, you, you just knew. He, he, it, 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 it was strange to be loved. Not strange, it was... Um, uh, oh, exceptionally 
uh, or joy or something to be loved in that way for uh, your writing. He made you feel that your writing was as important as your breathing. You know, are you breathing? Are you writing? And, you know, he would read my, uh, George Trow's plays. He was never going to publish uh, George's plays, but he would read them. And you just wrote everything uh, for him. You know, he would s say to George, anything new, Mr. Trow? <laughs> it was wonderful. It was like, um, what was it like? Oh, I used to say it was like uh, being a child uh, and you went, uh, who was very well off and you went to dinner and would say, caviar again? <laughs> <laughs> it was wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Well, Jamaica, can I ask you to read a little bit more from your, from your novel? Yes. Um, what would you like? Do you have a... Um, I, did you have a passage that you wanted to... Um, uh, well, um, I, I like to read about the children waiting uh, for their mother to pick them up. Um, uh, let me see if I... It, oh, yes, I can find it. It's very quick. It won't take long. But if you, if you find you might want to laugh, please do. People sometimes laugh when I read this. Uh, uh, Oh, so the children are waiting for their mother uh, to pick them up from the bus stop. That afternoon, at exactly quarter to four, the beautiful Persephone and the young Heracles got off the school bus and found that their mother, the dear Mrs. Sweet, was not waiting to pick them up. They saw the school bus, driven by the madly named Mr. Strange, disappear around the corner below the Bennington Monument. They saw their companions, some wayward boys and girls who lived in villages that were surrounded by evergreens of every kind, except for broadleaf, and the evergreens were all sick with a blight of rust. And these companions were very bad, for sometimes the boys among them pummeled the young Heracles almost to death, and the discipline he required to restore strain himself from gathering them up altogether in his large brown, ha brown hands and making them as lifeless as his old socks was greater than the force he had used to smite the entire city of Thebes as it appeared in his handheld Nintendo game. Those boys, in any case, had names of no distinguished origin, their names being Tad, Ted, Tim, and such. But the bus stop was empty of Mrs. Sweet, and the young Heracles was beside himself <clears throat> with anxiety and sorrow, for he loved his mother so, and only so. And a dark cloud full of a toxic fire emerged from his forehead, and he directed it toward the top of the Bennington Monument, a structure that was dedicated to a battle that led to a defeat and a triumph, and the defeated and the triumphant were now settled into the normal disfigurement of everyday living. And he caused it to fall to the ground, just missing a bus full of citizens from Germany who were taking a tour of New England just then. So beside himself was Heracles with anger and grief over Mrs. Sweet not being there to greet him when the school bus arrived at the bus stop that he sank to the ground, drew his feet up into his chest, his chin resting on his knees so that he looked like an illustration of a fully developed child intact in his mother's womb, an illustration commonly found on the walls of a doctor's office. Oh, come on, and that was the voice of the beautiful Persephone, his sister, and that is as it should be, for it was spring, and she was released from living in the depths of the pocket of Mr. Sweet's old Brooks Brothers tweed jacket. Not knowing what else to do, she lifted him up with much ease as if he were some just harvested asparagus or a pint of strawberries or a plate of peas or as if she were removing the hamster that had died overnight in its cage. And she placed him in the right-hand pocket of her own jacket, which was made from polyethylene theraphethalate, and the pocket itself was lined with rayon. Now, now, she said, as she stroked the curve of his back with her thumb, her forefingers shielding his head, which rested against his knees, it is very bad that she's not here to meet us once again when we get off from the school from when we get off the bus from school. Where the hell could she be? What the hell could she be doing? Oh, she just sits in that room writing about her goddamn mother, as if people had never had a mother who wanted to kill them before they were born in the history of the world. 
and the stupid father named Mr. Potter, who couldn't even read, and the fucking stupid little island in which she was born, full of stupid people whom history would be happy to forget. But she has to keep reminding everybody about that place and those people, and no one, and no one cares, and she can't stand it. And where is she? She's in that little room off the kitchen, and from that room she can see the kitchen, and she's making us whatever we all want to eat, and none of us want the same thing. And how she manages to keep writing that shit. Make her stop, make her stop before I kill her. And it was so much better when she would only knit us stockings that were too big before they were washed, and then were too small after they were washed, and they just gathered dust in the wash basket because she couldn't bear to throw them out after all the time she had spent knitting them, and, and the hats never kept us warm. They <coughs> fell into our eyes when we were skiing, and I almost killed myself coming down that black diamond wearing the stupid hat she had stayed up making for me as a present. And it is the stupid writing, it is the stupid writing, it is the stupid writing that's keeping her from being on time to meet the school bus that was driven by Mr. Strange. Ralph is his name, too, and that is not a name with a distinguished lineage. And a man, you know, who could be locked, who should be locked up in a jail in a cell that is buried underground, could come and pick us up and take us to his house and murder us or violate us sexually. And we would never be seen again or heard of again, not even, men not even be mentioned on the nightly news, vanish from the face of the earth like a species from a geological era that hasn't even yet been detected. What is she doing? What is she doing? What the hell is she doing? She's sitting there in that room at the big desk that Donald made for her, and she's thinking, thinking of a sentence, and the way to end it, my mother would kill me if she got the chance. I would kill my mother if I had the courage, and as if such a thing were possible. She lives in, the, in that world of the room with the desk and the kitchen just beyond, and she leaves us here all a man for a man to murder us, for tourists from Germany to stare at us, for all the other children and their mothers to see that she doesn't love us. She only loves the world that she carries around in her head, a torrent of lies all in her head. We are nothing to her, nothing, nothing, only those words in her head. And now look, the night is coming. The ink black night is going to swallow us up and we will never be found, for we will be lost in the night, the night itself, as if it were the ink black sea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll never be late picking up my kids again. <laughs> We have a little bit of time left, so if you don't mind, I'd like to open this up. I don't mind if, at uh, all. Some other people have some questions. <coughs> this one? Yes, uh, see now then. See now and then? Not and, just see now then. <laughs> Three words. Can you please stand so people can hear? <laughs> The importance of, of being nurtured in that group of small group of writers of New Yorker and having a, an editor who's supportive. I'm just wondering now that there's the, um, now with the proliferation of MFA programs and the MFA versus New York debate, I'm wondering what's your take on that now? Do you think that's something that's a model that's similar maybe to what you sort of uh, went through workshops on, or just go out and live life and so on? And so on. Yeah, well, the professionalization of writing is really interesting, and I don't want to say anything uh, against it, but I, um, uh, and I teach, so, um, but if they told me I couldn't teach it anymore, I wouldn't mind at all. Uh, I couldn't teach creative writing anymore. I don't really believe in it. I think that the, I, I don't, I don't think there is any model uh, for writing. I mean, there will be a theory about the novel, is this and that. But 
the novel is whatever you say it is, that every uh, work has its own laws that applies to it and it doesn't, Madame Bovary doesn't apply to A.B. Uh, Shaw. It's, uh, he has his, own, his work has its own dynamics, its own laws that tell you what it is. It's not um, applicable, but uh, creative writing program tends to do that. You know, I think the uh, the short story is Alice Munro, um, maybe John Cheever. There's a William Trevor, perhaps. Um, there's a uh, and the novel is this or so that, which is um, you know I suspect a lot of these people would not have a long career as a writer. A, a writing. It's not really a profession. For one thing, anybody can do it, and everybody does do it, including me. Uh, it's, I don't see how, it's not like being a doctor, or you don't have to be trained to do it, you, but you have to have something to do it, but I don't know what it is um, exactly. But the only reason to go to an MFA is because it will give you some, uh, chance to write, but then you'll have these idiots telling you what a sentence is, um, you know, people who, oh, don't get me. And, uh, <laughs> if you must go to an MFA, go. I wouldn't deter you from it. But the best training for a writer, it seems to me, is to read obsessively. Um, just read. Some people read obsessively and are not writers, but if you're going to be a writer, it seems to me that it would be better. Um, I, you know, go out and work on a steamer or scrub floors or, and then write. But um, yeah, you'll just be with people who feel entitled to something. And uh, writers also, yeah, being with a group of people, they'll be jealous of you. Be, don't do it. <laughs> Yes, don't, don't let her dominate the conversation. Isn't there anything else you want to know? Isn't there, wait, is there anybody else? No? Well, she's going to ask another question. Oh, yes, yes, please stand up. I want to know the process of writing, how you Do I go to, oh, I'm always in bed. I, if I'm alone, I eat in bed, I sleep in bed. <laughs> um, process of, I don't have any, uh, each book I've written has had its own laws of what it needed to get to it. Uh, I'm very undisciplined. The truth is I'd rather be reading um, than writing. Uh, so um, I basically, Right to support reading because I have to have some money to read, but um, I don't have any uh, advice in that. Uh, in any case, it would only apply to me. You'll have to find your own way. You could go out into the desert and eat um, locusts. No, locusts. <laughs> locusts are kosher. Um, but I don't have a way. I don't. Uh, yes, this is my translator, so you have to take everything. One of my translators, one of my translators, another one here. Yes, yes, he he he's an, he was my first. But so just to tell you, take everything she says with a grain of salt. Yes, because I'm I have one question. Sorry, speak up more. Uh, I have one question for you. Uh, I don't know uh, because I haven't read anything about it, and uh, I don't know if you want to speak about it because I see that uh, you rather not uh, um, analyze your work. And I'm not going to talk about the small place, but uh, I was wondering about motherhood mm. in your writing because you usually and uh, all throughout your career you were talking. Uh, uh, from the perspective of uh, the daughter. The daughter. <laughs> and uh, in your latest uh, no novel, the one we uh, heard from, uh, we, uh, we heard you uh, read from, um, it's 
stopped uh, the mother was talking, but uh, it's an uh, omnipotent uh, voice. But uh, the children here uh, in this uh, paragraph uh, throughout the, the story, you hear the mother, and you, you not hear the mother, but you understand the mother, and you understand the children as well. So they uh, infiltrated into the, uh, into the novel in another way that wasn't uh, familiar to me as a reader uh, before that. And I was wondering if you can uh, stress a bit about uh, what is motherhood, what the relationship between a mother and a child uh, for you or for, uh, for you as a novelist? Oh, oh, I don't know if I... Uh, uh, for me... Um, uh, when I was r writing uh, Annie John, um, the last chapter, uh, I, in the middle of writing it, I was pregnant with my daughter Annie, and I almost couldn't finish it because I was so tired of the voice of the, the complaining, whiny girl called Annie John. Um, I, I just couldn't see her point of view quite clear. I was very glad to be done uh, with it. but. Um, about motherhood, my uh, my own. I mean, my I, uh, I. I think I try not to replicate my uh, own childhood, but which only means I've done some other thing that was horrible. But I didn't know it was horrible. <laughs> um, so uh, I don't know what to say uh, about motherhood except uh, what Donald Winnicott said, a good enough mother. Um, <laughs> a good. How did it come about uh, in your latest novel? How did it, it, it feels like it's, uh, you're more willing to, to uh, enter other voices to... to uh, oh, I see. Um, in re yeah, in really Well, the, the mother-daughter uh, I have a complex, uh, if you want, uh, or relationship. Uh, um, it has, a, even though it seems to echo my own life autobiography, uh, the larger theme I was thinking about was the relationship between uh, the colony and the mother country. Um, it occurs to me that the social relations in colonies very much mother, uh, mirror and are modeled on the relationship between the colonial uh, power and uh, uh, the colony. So the children are uh, much brutalized, but it's because their parents are brutalized by uh, the system and the, uh, a system of, of colonization. And they, they exert an enormous amount of power over their children. The control uh, over their children is so unnecessary and so useless, uh, uh, really. But they are mirroring another uh, uh, powerful um, example and um, it. Oh, that's not my telephone. Um, it seems to me uh, that uh, I was um, uh, trying to say that I, I sometimes um, I, I'm too oblique, but I, I don't often like, it's funny to be called angry, because when you're angry, you speak directly. But I, I, I like um, uh, sometimes to be oblique, and it's sometimes I'm too uh, oblique. But those mother-daughter stories have a much larger context, larger uh, meaning, not to analyze my own work, which doesn't interest me at all, and which I never read unless I'm asked to. Having written it, it's just unbearable to read it. But um, uh, yeah, so um, that's what I would say. But a good enough mother is, yes, I was very comforted by that. Mm -hmm. Jamaica Kincaid, thank you so much. For